Hi, it's Kelly here. Welcome to my channel. If this is your first time, welcome back if you've been before. Lovely to have you either way. On this channel we talk books and today I am recording what I consider to be, even for me, an unhinged book haul. <laughs> There are so many books to show you. Um, this, these are all of the books that I've picked up in January. Now I've got a little collection here of um, books that I've bought new. Well, I say little, it's big, but I've been on holiday, so you've got to give me that one. I, I like to, <laughs> I like to go and um, support um, independent bookshops in the places where I go ho on holidays. So I'll always make an effort to go and find something to buy in an independent bookshop. Um, also, I picked up a few things on sale, etc. So I've got a, a few things to show you in the new books. It's the second-hand book shopping, which is kind of my favourite thing to do <laughs> when I am on holidays, is to go to second-hand shops that sell books or exclusively sell books um, and try and find some bargains. And I have found many bargains. Uh, the pile is insane. So we'll come to that. <laughs> Let's start though with the new books. So I'm going to show you first of all some non-fiction books that I've picked up to complete a collection of books that I uh, already had a couple of. Um, I've got some poetry, I've got some literary fiction and one random fantasy. So um, let's start with the non-fiction. So I'm actually going to show you all four of these books together uh, because they are from the same collection. So this is the first Knowledges collection um, and I hauled a couple of books from this collection um, second hand I, and also I think I might have picked one up um, at a discount price etc. Um, so I've now I just decided I wanted to complete the collection um, while it's available because I don't know if it's going to continue to be available. So I have picked up Songlines, which is uh, The Power and the Promise by Margot Neal and Lynn Kelly. I have picked up Astronomy Sky Country by Carly Noon and Crystal DiNapoli. Uh, I have picked up Plants, Past, Present and Future by Zena Cumpston, Michael Sean Fletcher and Leslie Head. And I have picked up Law, The Way of the Ancestors by Marsha Langton and Aaron Korn. So those are the four um, books that I decided to just complete that collection so that I could, my mind could be at rest <laughs> about having all of them um, and being able to read all of them. So I'm excited to get to um, some of those probably this year. Maybe not the entire collection, but hopefully um, I'll be picking up one or two of them um, this year as part of my reading. Uh, let's have a look at the poetry that I've picked up now. If you can hear jingly bells in the in the background, it's my cats running amok in the house, um, and they will make the noise they make. That it's it's obviously the zoomies hour. <laughs> Of the day. Uh, okay, let's move on to the poetry now. Um, so I start with a poetry collection uh, as part of the modern class, the Penguin Modern Classics, uh, Louise Gluck, Poems 1962 to 2020. Um, I actually have not read that many poems by Louise Gluck. Gluck, I don't know how you say a word that has the, is it an umlaut over the U? Anyway. I don't know what that means for pronunciation, so I apologise. I'm just going to say Gluck, because that is phonetically how it's spelt, but um, please let me know down in the comments if you know the correct pronunciation for this author's surname. Um, so she is a, it says on the back here, a, she's a Nobel Prize winner, um, and this is 12 collections from her early firstborn to the myth-making Averno and the, quest, the questing faithful and virtuous knight. Together they immerse us in the artistry and vision of one of the world's greatest poets. So I think I what happened was I read a poem by Louise Gluck and I was like, yeah, I, I like the style of this poem. And then I was like, I'll just pick up the collection. Didn't pay any attention to how big it was. Uh, and it turns out it is 696 pages of her poetry. So I don't know that this is a collection I'm going to sit and read the entirety of at any point, um, but you never know, maybe I will. Um, I think it's probably more one that I'll dip in and out of. So you probably won't uh, see me doing a wrap-up of this poetry collection 
on this channel just because it's so huge <laughs> and like that's a lot of poetry from one poet to consume in one sitting you know what I mean well like consuming it in a in a run um, I am probably more likely to kind of pick and choose with a with a collection this big so that one I'm excited about but also a little bit daunted by the other poetry collection I picked up was this one the body country by Susie Anderson I can't remember where I heard about this one I think I might have even just seen it in a book catalog and it just sounded really interesting to me uh, I believe this author is an Aboriginal person yes they are um, so uh, were Gaia and Wemba Wemba um, are the nations that this uh, poet is from so uh, she captures profound meaning in moments that often slip through the cracks from the shape of a mouth as it says goodbye and the color of the sky as you fall in love to the smell of fire on the wind and the movement of ants before rain though through lyrical prose and poetic musings Susie asks us to consider the physical self as a container for all our experience and how it relates to First Nations understanding of country so this just sounded really interesting to me um, and I believe this was one of the ones that I picked up in an independent bookshop shop while I was um, shopping during the holidays so um, I'm really glad to now have this in my poetry collection and I will this is one uh, given its smaller size that I would more likely read in one go so this is no, only 95 pages um, so that's much more manageable than over 600 uh, so those are the poetry let's move on now to the literary fiction so I've picked up a couple of these. Um, one just turned up randomly. I ordered this book so long ago and I've been getting messages periodically being like, sorry, we, we don't know what's going on. We're, you know, trying to, trying to get this book to you. We'll give you an update of when it's going to come. No update, just turned up. And it's probably been about, I don't know, six months. <laughs> just, just waiting and then just randomly one day it turns up. Uh, and that book is Rianne Bell by Priya Hine. Uh, who is the person I have been hearing talking about this? Uh, it's someone on BookTube, so I will put their um, name, uh, their channel name, and also the link, a link to their channel down in the description below. Um, and it was this person's, it was one of their favourite reads of the year last year. So I was really excited about it um, just from hearing them talking about it. Uh, so I've picked it up. Finally, it's arrived. I, I ordered it basically as soon as I started hearing them talking about it because they were so excited about it. Um, I've always wondered why there isn't any mention of people like me in textbooks, it says on the back. The history we are taught is not about anyone in my family, even in our, our meagre school library. The books imported from Europe are full of foreign faces having adventures in faraway places. I never see myself in those stories. Um, so this is about a character who is 15 years old. Her name's Noemi, and she has no choice but to leave school and work in the house of a wealthy family. Just across the road from the slums where she grew up, she encounters a world that is starkly different from her own, yet one which would have been all too familiar to her ancestors. Bewitched by a pair of green eyes and haunted by echoes, her life begins to mirror those of girls who have gone before her. Um, so this is uh, set in Mauritius, um, and I'm really looking forward to reading this. Again, this is a quite a short one, uh, 155 pages, so not long at all. Um, and I am keen, keen to get to it. Another one that I picked up in an independent bookshop while I was on holidays is I'd Rather Not by Robert Skinner. I've been hearing things about this. I believe it's supposed to be quite funny, um, sort of like a dry humour is, is my best guess. Um, but this is an Australian author, and I'll read the back to you. It says, I was sleeping in what might reasonably be described as a ditch, though I tried not to think of it in those terms for morale reasons. Robert Skinner arrives in the city searching for a richer life. Oh, maybe this is nonfiction. I, I've been tricked before. I'm going to treat it like it's fiction, <laughs> but it could be nonfiction. I might have to look this one up. Uh, so he arrives in the city searching for a richer life. Things begin badly and then, surprisingly, get slightly worse. Pretty soon he's sleeping rough and trying to run a literary magazine out of a dog park. His quest for meaning keeps being thwarted by endless jobs, beagles, house parties, ill-advised love affairs, camel trips, and bureaucratic entanglements. Sometimes the book catches the spirit of the times. I'd Rather Not is about work, escape, and that's, some and that's something more 
we all need. This sounds amazing. Um, so yeah, excited about this. I will have to look up and see if this is fiction or nonfiction. Uh, but Annabelle Crabb, who is um, someone who I really love, she's a political journalist um, and she's also written a cookbook that I have. <laughs> um, so she's amazing. I love Annabelle Crabb and she calls this an absolute bag of lollies. So that is praise indeed. <laughs> okay, another one that I've picked up and this I picked up because it was... Um, it uh, came down to a reasonable price for me and it turned out to be a hardback which I'm excited about I ordered this one online is Salonica Burning by Gail Jones I genuinely cannot remember who I heard talking about this one but it has been on my wish list for a while so I must have heard someone talking about it and then popped it onto the wish list uh, but this one is set in Macedonia 1917 the great city of Salonika is engulfed by fire as all of Europe is ravaged by war amid the destruction are those who have come from the front lines to heal surgeons ambulance drivers nurses orderlies and other volunteers four of them Stella Olive Grace and Stanley are at the center of Gail Jones's extraordinary new novel which takes its inspiration from the wartime experiences of Australians Miles Franklin and Olive King, and British painters Grace Palethorpe and Stanley Spencer. In Jones's imagination, these four lives intertwine and change, each compelled by the desire to create something meaningful in the ruins of a broken world. Immersive and gripping, Salonica Burning illuminates not only the devastation of war, but also the vast social upheaval of the times. It shows Gail Jones to be at the height of her powers. I'm really excited for this um, yeah, especially given that it's been sitting on my wish list for such a long time. I'm really pleased that I now have it in my hot little hands. Okay, two more books to show you now. One more literary fiction. Uh, that is Sunbirds by Miranda Riwo. Uh, I think I saw this one in um, just in a catalogue and had kind of clocked it as one I was interested in. Um, but I picked it up in an independent bookshop um, while I was away on holidays. So uh, this one is set in Indonesia. So it's 14, sorry, 1941 West Java. Love and revolution are in the air and war is on its way. Shortly before the Japanese invade, the Van Horn family throws their famous Sinterklaas party at their tea plantation. One of their guests, Mat oh, I don't know how to say this name, it's a Dutch name, M-A-T-T-I-J-S, Matij, Matij, Mati. Anyway, that person, a Dutch pilot, hopes to forge a future in the Dutch East Indies, possibly with the family's daughter, Anna. But she is torn between her dreams of Holland and her desire to belong. Meanwhile, the housekeeper, Dia, keenly observes the goings-on around the plantation, wondering how much to tell her freedom-fighting brother. When the Japanese forces finally arrive on Java's doorstep, they all have to make decisions that will affect the rest of their lives, especially those who must evacuate to Australia. Sunbirds depicts the intricate web of identities and loyalties created by war and imperialism and the heartbreaking compromises that so often ensue. Sounds a little connected to the last one. Um, so that's exciting and I'm really keen to read this one. The cover is also absolutely stunning. Um, so well done to the people who designed the cover. The last new book I have to show you is this one. Uh, this is the fantasy I alluded to earlier. It's called Half Sick of Shadows by Laura Sebastian. Uh, and I believe I picked this one up uh, on sale. And that's why I picked it up. It's a bit random. I hadn't heard of it before. I saw it on the sale. I was it read the synopsis and it sounded good. Um, so, the Lady of Shalott reclaims her story in this bold feminist reimagining of the Arthurian, Arthurian myth from the New York Times bestselling author of Ash Princess, which I have not heard of. Apologies to this author. Everyone knows the legend of Arthur destined to be, king, be a king, of the beautiful Guinevere who will betray him with his most loyal knight Lancelot, of the bitter sorceress Morgana who will turn against them all. But Elaine alone carries the burden of knowing what is to come, for Elaine of Shalott is cursed to see the future. On the mystical Isle of Avalon, Elaine runs free and learns of the ancient prophecies surrounding her and her friends, countless possibilities, almost all of them tragic. When their future comes to claim them, Elaine, Guinevere, Lancelot and Morgana accompany Arthur to take his throne in stifling Camelot, where magic is outlawed. 
the rules of society chain them, and enemies are everywhere. Yet the most dangerous threats may come from within their own circle. As visions are fulfilled and an, and an inevitable fate closes in, Elaine must decide how far she will go to change destiny and what she is willing to sacrifice along the way. It just sounds great. Um, I'm really uh, into the Arthurian um, uh, stories at the moment. Um, I've just read Perilous Times, um, which I loved, and so I, which is um, based on Arthurian legend, but in the modern day. Um, so really kind of like it's, it's in my brain right now. So when I saw this, I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> I am going to get that. So I'm excited about that. Okay. So those are the new books that I have uh, purchased in the month of January. Let's now turn our attention to the secondhand books, the unhinged pile that is towering next to me. Okay, let's start with the non-fiction books in this collection, uh, which is unhinged. I've just counted the total uh, number of books that I am presenting to you today. There are 11 in the new books section. My total, including the new books, is 30 books. So this this is a big book haul even for me <laughs> and I can do a big book haul. Okay, let's talk about the non-fiction now. Uh, the first one is This Much Is True by Miriam Margulies. Uh, this is a memoir written by the lovely Miriam. Uh, this one I got for free in a little free library so I was very excited to pick that one up um, and yeah, that was a, a good find I feel. The next non-fiction book that I picked up, again, I think I may have gotten this one in a little free library, um, but it's The Golden Maze, A Biography of Prague by Richard Feidler. I've not read Richard Feidler, but I own now several of his books. This, I think, well, I say several, two, including this one. I own another of his books called Sagaland, which I've spoken about before, um, that came really highly recommended by somebody. Um, so I'm kind of keen to get into his writing but his books are all gigantic um so yeah anyway i think i picked this one up in a little free library as well so this was a really really good find let me see how many pages this is 580 pages so it's a big one um but yeah i'm really excited to now have this one it's one that i've sort of had my eye on for some time so to find a free copy was pretty amazing uh, another non-fiction one that I've picked up is this one, Where Song Began by Tim Lowe, Australia's Birds and How They Changed the World. I bought a copy of this book for my mum um, because she's really into birds uh, and I just was super interested uh, in it. I haven't gone back to borrow it back off her and then I just found this copy so and just for a couple of bucks. So I was pretty pleased about that. Um, oh, it has colour pictures in the middle. That's exciting. It has a whole section of um, pictures of Australian birds. Um, so, yeah, exciting, very exciting to have this now in my collection as well. Um, so I'll be able to pick this one up. Let me see how many pages it is. There's a bibliography and an index at the back and notes. So getting to the actual book itself. My, my, my. Okay, not too bad. So this is about 318 pages of text, um, not including all of the appendices at the end. So, yeah, excited about that one. And the other uh, non-fiction book I've picked up is this one, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot. Uh, who did I hear speaking about this? If I can remember, I'll pop it up on the screen and link to the channel below. Um, the person who was speaking about it didn't particularly like this book, but the story was really fascinating. So that's the reason I've picked this up because I'm fascinated by this story. Um, so Henrietta Lacks is a woman who has been virtually unknown for um, decades, uh, but she is she was a poor southern tobacco farmer whose cancer cells, taken without her knowledge, became one of the most important tools in medicine. The first immortal immortal human tissue grown in culture, HeLa cells, H-E-L-A, um, Henrietta Lacks, uh, were vital for developing the polio vaccine, uncovered 
uncovering secrets of cancer, viruses, and the effects of the atom bomb helped to lead to important advances like in vitro fertilization, cloning, and gene mapping, and have been bought and sold by the billions. Um, so this is sort of talking about what her cells and have been used for, um, but also this kind of checks in with her family um, when they discovered that this had happened um, and sort of like the fallout from, from that because they've, you know, taken her cells without her knowledge and her, you know, those cells have lived on after she's passed away and sort of what the kind of moral uh, aspect of that story is. So that's a really fascinating story to me and I'm really interested to read about it. Um, but yeah, I don't believe that the person who I saw talking about this book was recommending the book per se, um, but just the story itself. Um, so yeah, excited about that one. I've got a couple more books now. I'm just going to pop that pile over here. I'm just trying to manage this unruly <laughs> stack. Okay, so next I've got a um, poetry collection and that is Classic Australian Poems, edited by Christopher Cheng, illustrated by Gregory Rogers. So this is um, potentially for children. The images definitely kind of give that impression. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to sort of read these. I know some of them I will have read be before, um, but others like Clancy of the Overflow I've read before. Um, potentially more. <laughs> uh, but yeah I'm just interested to see what they consider to be classics and um, to read through these poems because I think it's important to kind of know your cultural heritage as it were uh, in terms of poetry so that's that one then I've got a couple of kids books or you know um, not YA but sort of a middle grade I guess um, so the first one is this, which is the second book in the Enola Holmes mystery series. I've read the first one and I quite enjoyed it. Um, and I found this one uh, secondhand. So this is The Case of the Left-Handed Lady by Nancy Springer. Um, so I'm keen to read that second book in that collection. This one is The Wolf Wilder by Catherine Rundell. Um, and I have a feeling that this one might be one I've actually already read but didn't have a copy of. Uh, it says, Theo could not remember a time when she had not known and loved the wolves. It was impossible not to love them. She could howl, her mother used to say, before she could talk. Wolves made sense to her. Wolves, Theo thought, were one of the few things worth dying for. This is the book I'm thinking of. I have actually already read this. Yeah, I think I have actually. And I really enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, this is exciting to now have a, a, quite a lovely copy of it um, and to have found it secondhand for four dollars. Bargain. Um, I've also picked up this one, which is this, His Name Was Walter by Emily Rodder. Emily Rodder is a prolific um, uh, Australian middle grade writer. And she also, I think, has done a bit of YA, but mostly middle grade is kind of where she, she does her things. Um, so this one is, uh, on the back it says, Once upon a time in a dark city far away, there lived a boy called Walter who had nothing but his name to call his own. The handwritten book with its strangely vivid illustrations has been hide hidden in the old house for a long, long time. Tonight, four students and their teacher will find it. Tonight, at last, the haunting story of Walter and the mysterious girl called Sparrow will be read right to the very end. So, it just sounds really interesting. This is a copy that's in really good condition, and I got it for four bucks, so good bargain for me. Um, and the last of the uh, children's books, middle grade books, is A Wrinkle in Time by Mad Madeline Langle. La Engel. Uh, this is, what does that say? John Newberry medal so this is a newberry medal winner um we've all heard of a wrinkle in time so i don't need to tell you about it but i have not read it before and i did not have a copy of it so now i do okay moving on now to just the general fiction let me just move my pile forward so that i can reach it a little bit easier okay we've got this one which is called wars of the roses Stormbird" by con eagulden eagulden uh, I don't know anything about this. I remember 
buying this. It's not in particularly great condition, so it's a little bit um, yellowed and uh, the edges of it are not uh, not good. But I was in a very tiny secondhand shop on, while I was on my holidays and I was determined to find something. And so this was the thing that I found uh, in the, because this lady had um, that was working at this tiny, <laughs> tiny little secondhand shop was like, I've got more books that have, some, have just been donated in bags. Um, do you want, you want to have a look through the bags? I'm like, yeah, sure. Um, and so that I'm, you know, looking through and most of it was not stuff I was particularly interested in. So this was the one that I was like, OK, so I'm kind of taking a chance on this one. <laughs> um, so it says King Henry V, the great line of England is long dead. In 1437 his gentle son comes of age and takes the throne. Frail in body and mind, King Henry VI is dependent on his supporters to run his kingdom. Richard, Duke of York, however, believes that without a strong king, England will fall. His fears seem justified as English power comes under threat from France and discontent and rebellion spread at home. On the council of his advisers, Henry marries the young Princess Margaret of Anjou in order to forge an alliance with France, but is it too late? As the storm clouds gather, King Henry and his Queen are besieged abroad and at home. Who can save the throne? Who will save the kingdom? Um, so, I don't know anything about this other than uh, this is book one, I believe, in a series called The Wars of the Roses. Um, yeah, so it should be interesting. I guess. Um, and this guy has written quite a lot, quite a lot of books. So, um, yeah, should be a good one, but we'll see. It's a bit of a chance. <laughs> the next one that I've picked up is House of Sand and Fog, uh, by Andre du Dubus, Dubu, Dubus the third. Um, I don't know much about this one. Um, I think it was the title of this that made me think it was something that I'd heard about before, so I just picked it up. Uh, so it says, In this riveting novel of almost unbearable suspense, three fragile yet determined people become dangerously entangled in a relentlessly escalating crisis. Colonel Barani, once a wealthy man in Iran, is now a struggling immigrant willing to bet everything he has to restore his family's dignity. Kathy Nicolo is a troubled young woman whose house is all she has left and who refuses to let her hard-won stability slip away from her. Sheriff Lester Burden, a married man who finds himself falling in love with Kathy, becomes obsessed with helping her fight for justice. Drawn by their competing desires to the same small house in the California hills and doomed by their tragic inability to understand one another, the three converge in an explosive collision course. Combining unadorned realism with profound empathy, House of Sand and Fog marks the arrival of a major new voice in American fiction. So, sounds interesting, but I don't really, I don't know when I'm going to get to it, but I picked it up thinking it was something I'd heard of before, so, yeah. This one is one that I've never heard of before, uh, and I picked it up basically because of this cover, <laughs> to start with. It's called Pastoral, a novel by Andre Alexis. Uh, this one was $3, so again, one I'm taking a bit of a chance on. The very first parish Father Christopher Pennant is assigned to is the rural town of Barrow. With more sheep than people, it is sleepily bucolic. Too much Barrow brew on Barrow Day is the rowdiest it gets. But things aren't so idyllic for Liz Denny, whose fiancé doesn't want to have to choose between Liz and his more worldly lover Jane. Or for Father Pennant himself, whose faith is profoundly shaken by three miracles he witnesses. A man walking on water, trained gypsy moths, and a talking sheep. In this surprising and delightful new novel, the award-winning Andre Alexis tackles fundamental questions of love and faith by bringing a modern sensibility and a new liveliness to an age-old genre, the pastoral. Pastoral. I never really know how to say that word. I think it's pastoral. Anyway, that one just sounded really interesting and the cover is absolutely delightful. Okay, let me just pop these down. I've got the next lot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven to go. Um, okay, and I need to go quickly because I am running out of time on my... I've got nine minutes left on my uh, camera. So here we go. Uh, this one is The Language of Food by Annabelle Abbs. I've been seeing this one because this cover is so stunning in the bookshops, but I really didn't 
feel drawn enough to it to pick it up at full price but I found it secondhand so I've picked it up. Uh, this is set in England in 1835 when Eliza Acton is told by her publisher to write a cookery book instead of the poetry she loves she refuses but after her father is forced to flee the country Eliza must earn a living. Despite ha never having cooked she is determined to learn. She hires young destitute Anne Kirby to help in the kitchen and together they discover a mutual talent and passion for cooking and for recipe writing. But as Anne finds her, a voice of her own, their radical friendship starts to fray. Based on the true story of Britain's first domestic goddess, The Language of Food is a sumptuous feast of a novel about the woman who changed the course of cookery writing forever. So it does sound really interesting. It's a historical fiction that's based on true story. So it should be good. I'm excited about that one. Uh, this is one I have a digital copy of, but I um, did, hadn't yet gotten to it and was excited to find a physical copy of, um, and that is Maduka, Maduka, The River Serpent by Julie Jansen. This was nominated for, I think, the Stella Prize last year, um, and it was one that didn't make it through to the shortlist, um, so I didn't end up reading it at the time, uh, but I, it was one that I had flagged as one I wanted to read, so I will eventually get to this one. Uh, so it says on the back, Auntie June is the proud owner of a TAFE certificate three in investigative services. It took her 30 hours to complete online. Now she has set up her own private investigation service, Yanakiri Investigative Services Confidentiality Guaranteed. When environmental activist Tomo suddenly goes missing and the police ignore the case, Auntie June takes it upon herself to uncover the secrets surrounding her nephew, Tomo's disappearance. Uh, her nephew, Tomo's disappearance. Sorry. Sorry about that. Let's let's continue on. Corruption, commercial cotton farmers, uh, bikies, racism, water theft, and unreliable local police. Arnie June is really up against it. Lies and corruption are hiding the truth from reaching the surface, and the Darling River, the sacred Barker, is running out of water. Auntie June may be out of her depth, but nothing will stop her fighting for her people and her land. So I'm really excited about this one. I definitely do want to read it, and I'm hoping that I will get to it this year um, because, yeah, it was one that I didn't quite get to at the time, and I really, really wanted to. Okay, this was another exciting find, um, and this is Difficult Women by Roxane Gay. I've never actually read anything by Roxane Gay, but I've heard lots of really good things about her writing, so I'm really excited to um, have found this one. Uh, so this is a collection of stories of rare force and beauty, of hard scrabble lives, passionate loves, and quirky and vexed human connection from award-winning author and powerhouse talent Roxane Gay. The women in these stories live lives of privilege and of poverty, are in marriages both loving and haunted by past crimes or emotional blackmail. A woman married to a twin pretends not to realise when her husband and his brother impersonate each other. A stripper putting herself through college fends off the advances of an overzealous customer. A black engineer moves to Upper Michigan for a job and faces the malign curiosity of her co colleagues and the difficulty of leaving her past behind. From a girls' fight club to a wealthy subdivision in Florida where neighbours can form compete and spy on each other, Gay gives a voice to a chorus of unforgettable women in a haunting vision of modern America. So sounds really, really good. The next one I've got is Romantic Comedy by Curtis Sittenfield. This is a really recent release. I want to say it's a 2023 release. Yes, it is. Um, so I was excited to find this one. I've never read any Curtis Sittenfield, but again, I've heard good things. Um, so this one says, life is not a romantic comedy. With a series of heartbreaks under her belt, Sally Miltz, successful script, TV scriptwriter for a legendary late night t TV comedy show, has long abandoned the search for love. But when her friend and fellow writer begins to date a glamorous actress, he joins the growing club of interesting but average looking men who get romantically involved with beautiful, accomplished women. Sally channels her annoyance into a sketch, poking fun at this social rule, because, after all, the reverse never happens for women. Then Sally meets Noah, a pop idol with a reputation for dating models. But this isn't a romantic comedy, it's real life. Would someone like him ever date someone like her? Skewering all our certainties about why we fall in love, romantic comedy is a witty and probing tale of how the heart will follow itself no matter what anyone says. It is Curtis Sittenfield at her most sharp, daring, and compassionate. The third from last, so three books to go, um, is Ali Smith's Public Library and Other Stories, funnily enough, withdrawn from a library. <laughs> uh, and it is the Kayama Public Library, which it has one of these. So exciting. 
Uh, it looks like it has only been borrowed one time, but perhaps that was, yeah, anyway, in 20, 28th of February 2017. Uh, so anyway, this one says, why are books in all their forms so very powerful? What do the books we've read uh, over our lives, our own personal libraries make of us? What does the unravelling of our tradition of public libraries, so hard won, but now in jeopardy, say about us? The stories in Ali Smith's new collection are about what we do with books, and what they do with us, how they travel with us, friends for life, how they shock us, change us, challenge us, banish time, while making us older, wiser and ageless all at once, how they coax us endlessly to unexpected blossom, how they remind us to pay attention to the world we make. So this sounds really, really good and I'm excited to have that one. Kate Richardson, sorry, Kate Richards Fusion. Uh, is another one I picked up again. This one was only $3, so bargain. Forever entwined, C and Serene live isolated in the Australian Alpine wilderness together with Ren, the young man who helps care for them. Each has found peace in this wild, fierce landscape and they live in harmony, largely self-sufficient. One day, Ren discovers a woman on the road nearby, badly injured and unconscious. He brings her back to the cottage. He and the twins nurse her back to health. But the arrival of this outsider shatters the dynamic within with unforeseen consequences. Lyrical and poetic, Fusion is a unique and haunting modern Gothic tale that has at its heart questions of selfhood, dependency, difference and love. It is a compelling first novel by the award-winning author of Madness, a memoir. So this sounds really good. It's actually been, I've had a digital copy of this for some time and I haven't gotten to it, but I feel now that I have this physical copy, I will get to it much sooner. Okay, last one is Joan by Catherine J. Chen. I've been hearing things about this one and I'm excited about it. Uh, Girl, warrior, heretic, saint, question mark. France is mired in a losing war against England. Its people are starving. Its king is in hiding. Yet out of the chaos, an unlikely heroine emerges. Reckless, steel-willed and brilliant, Joan has survived a childhood steeped in both joy and violence to claim an extraordinary and fragile position at the head of the French army. But the battlefield and the royal court are full of dangers and Joan finds herself under suspicion from all sides, as well as under threat from her own ambition. With unforgettably vivid characters and propulsive storytelling, Joan is a thrilling epic, a triumph of historical fiction and a feminist celebration of one remarkable and remarkably real woman who left an indelible mark on history. So excited about that one. Okay, that is it. That is the whole so many books so so many books um but excited to have all of these now in my collection and uh excited to hear down in the comments if you've read any of them if you think i should put them up to the top of my tbr please let me know um i'd love to hear down in the comments as well if you have found any exciting new things while out shopping especially secondhand shopping because that's always the fun hunt isn't it <laughs> okay thanks for watching guys and i will catch you on the next one bye